Islamic terrorists true enemy is Christianity. Islamic terrorists murder men, women, and children in their quest for power, but their number one target is the follower of Jesus Christ. They use slogans like death to America because America and its ideals are rooted in the religion of Jesus Christ. The reason that Christianity is anathema to them is that our religion is one of freedom, unlike their own, whose main purpose is to enslave, hence the name Islam, which means surrender or submission. Although the world is in upheaval because of the violence and threats and massive immigration of Muslims and their religion into Western nations, there is one positive outcome produced by their movement. And that is that Islam's violence and oppressive nature more clearly highlights the freedom that we have as Christians. Christianity and not military or political might is the most powerful response to radical Islam's attempt to rule the world. For example, the Christian religion gives believers, or rather unbelievers, the freedom to disbelieve in peace. Islam, on the other hand, seeks to rule politically as well as religiously. The ultimate goal of this religion is that every nation is in subjection to Islam and all political systems are modified or replaced by Sharia law. Sharia, meaning the way or the path, is a set of religious principles which form part of the Muslim culture. The rules for life and religion were derived from the Quran, which Muslims claim was a revelation given by God to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Other sources for Sharia law include the actions and words of Muhammad, the writings of scholars when they agreed on a point of law, and logical conclusions arrived at through human reason. Sharia in Islam is viewed as the revealed will of God and cannot be altered. Opinions on what Sharia laws mean and how they are to be applied are subject to debate and disagreement. However, there is no debate concerning the true goal of Islam, which is world domination by whatever means necessary. I quote their own scripture here. It is he who has sent his messengers forth with the guidance and religion of truth to make it triumph over every religion, even though the idolaters may be averse. Surah 61 verse nine. I give you another quote from Syed Abu Lala Maududi, a world renowned Islamic scholar who traced his own ancestry back to Muhammad. I quote, Islam is a revolutionary faith that comes to destroy any government made by man. It's not about democratic government, parliamentarian government, monarch, a monarchy, any government made by man. Islam is out to destroy. The goal of Islam is to rule the entire world and submit all of mankind to the faith of Islam. Any nation or power that gets in the way of that goal, Islam will fight and destroy. In order to fulfill that goal, Islam can use every power available, every way it can be used to bring worldwide revolution. This is jihad. Remember, this is not my quote. This is their quote from their leaders. So 
polite denials of this fact here by so-called moderate American Muslims in order to quell fear, ignore the teachings of their own scriptures and their own teachers. Moderate Muslims are either acting in ignorance or they're working for the same goal as terrorists, but they're approaching it with different tactics. The terrorists try to intimidate and take over using violence and aggression. The moderates infiltrate city councils, school boards, political action groups, and attempt to take over from within. Since 2001, I'll give you an example. Since 2001, in the city of London, 500 churches have closed their doors and 423 new mosques have opened to replace them. This isn't some internet stat floating around on the flotsam of, you know, of, of the World Wide Web. These are statistics by the Gatestone Institute of International Policy and Council. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, is a practicing Muslim. We have statistics here in the United States as well. In the United States, there are approximately 3.5 million Muslim, mostly 60% of which are immigrants, like first generation. There are 2,100 mosques in the United States. You'd be surprised to know 290 of them are in New York City. However, there are 55 mosques in Dallas. There are 63 in Houston. There are 11 here in Oklahoma City. And these figures are from a National Geographic study that just came out about a month ago. They use Western laws and individual freedoms to gain control of institutions and establish platforms to spread the false information that Islam is a religion of peace and can be a blessing on society. Of course, a quick review of the countries where Islam prevails reveals nations where women are considered as being less valuable than men and societies that live in either poverty or war or silent oppression. You hear moderates always say, well, it's a religion of peace, come on over, visit the mosque. We have a food bank, we have this and that, but I guarantee you, if Islam ever became the religion of this state or this country, I would not be allowed to stand up in public and say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I guarantee you that. Amen. It never works in reverse. It never works in reverse. Now they're very happy to come and use the freedoms of our nations to establish mosques, thousands of them, as many as they can establish. You try to do that in one of their countries, you don't get anywhere. No one should buy into the moderate Muslims cheerful and harmless facade. World domination is the core goal of Islam and this is pursued in various ways and means. With Islam, the end justifies any means necessary, any means. Make no mistake, this is and will always be the end game, whether it happens now or in 100 years from now. In countries where Islam is the national religion, there is no toleration for any other belief system, unlike our own country, including the choice to disbelieve in religion altogether. You either believe or, depending on the country or the strain of Islam, you are completely rejected by your family and society or you're imprisoned or you're killed. Christianity, on the other hand, does not seek to rule any nation politically. Jesus said to the governor Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Christianity calls people to come out of the world in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Colossians 1, verse 13. Christians are trained to live 
or be in the world but not be of the world, John 17, verse four and five, 14 and 15 rather. Christianity teaches that this world will be destroyed and replaced with a new heaven and earth where Christ will rule and all who are there will live in peace. John writes about this in Revelation. After these things I looked and behold great multitudes which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, Amen. Does that sound like somebody who's trying to organize an earthly kingdom here? Christians appeal to others in sincere love and patience to be saved from the sure judgment and destruction coming upon this physical world sent by God, not man. In the meantime, Christians are taught to live a quiet and holy life while awaiting Christ's return. 1 Thessalonians chapter four. Paul says, now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. And then of course, Paul says, remind them, Paul says to Titus, remind them to be subject to rulers. Does that sound like revolution to you? Does that sound like take over the country at any cost, using any means to you? Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Does that sound like undermining the government, undermining the rules of society to you? We don't punish and kill disbelievers. We pray for them. We continue to reach out to them in love. In Christianity, there is a judgment, there is a punishment, but only God gets to execute this judgment and punishment. Our task is to proclaim to all men the way to avoid God's wrath and love all men, including those who disbelieve. We love disbelievers, we don't torture them. Another freedom within Christianity. We have the freedom to live as we choose. That's not an American thing, that's a Christian thing. Amen. Islam directs every facet of both secular and religious life. Not only how you worship, which most religions dictate, but also how you must dress and eat and who you can or cannot marry. For example, in Muslim countries, uh, they have what is called the mutawin or the religious police, also known as the guidance patrol. These are government authorized officials who enforce Sharia law among the people. They make sure that dress codes are followed, especially for women. They also guard against improper public association of unrelated men and women who do not have a guardian. These officials use public beatings in order to guarantee compliance. This constant monitoring, monitoring in is, is in addition to the practice of their religion itself, which is based on the five pillars of, uh, of Islam. And I want to just review those very quickly with you. The religion of Islam, the practice of it is built around these five pillars of faith. There's the first one, the shahada, the confession of faith, which is there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. It is necessary to say this in order to convert to Islam. It is then repeated daily. There is also the salah or the prayer 
the obligatory prayer five times daily, at dawn, at noon, in the afternoon, in the evening, and at night. These prayers are done facing the Kaaba, which is the cube, which is a building at the center of the sacred mosque in Saudi Arabia. There's the zakat, or the charity. The custom is to give 2.5%. However, there is a complex calculation to obtain the correct amount. Something like filling out federal income tax form. It's about as complex. The zakat, however, is an obligatory tax levied on all believers, all Muslims. There's the sham or fasting, obligatory fasting from dawn till dusk each day during the month of Ramadan. Its purpose is to seek forgiveness and draw near to God. And then there's the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim is obliged to travel to Mecca and participate in the activities associated with pilgrimage during the Hajj season once in a lifetime. Or you can sponsor somebody if you wish to go in your, in your place. Sunni Muslims, many different kinds of Muslims, Sunni Muslims, um, um, for them, there are only five pillars, but there are variations of these among other Muslim groups. The Shia Muslims, for example, have an additional 10 pillars called the ancillaries of the faith. And the Ismailis have seven pillars, including one called uh, jihad, which means uh, struggle. Now I mention all of these you know, to familiar, uh, familiarize yourself a little bit with the, with the nature of this religion. Those who enjoy a life completely controlled and enforced by laws and punishment will naturally take to this ultra legalistic religion. You know, I, I, I want to break from my notes here to make a, you know, to make a point here. Uh, I, I'm not against the quote, people of a culture from another country. This is a comparison of a religion with another. This is a comparison of Christianity to Islam. Okay? This is what this is. And what I'm trying to do in my lesson is to show you the superiority on every level of Christianity. But if you like a legalistic lifestyle, controlled every moment of your day, then this is the religion for you. I mean, Islam makes the Jewish Pharisees of Jesus' day look like a bunch of libertarians. Christianity, however, frees a person from all man-made religious rules and restrictions, which is what Islam is, man-made and enforced religious rules and rituals. That's all it is. Long before Islam came along, there were others who were trying to pollute Christianity with these types of religious sounding rules. And Paul the Apostle responded to these people. In Colossians chapter two, he says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why? As if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgences. 2,000 years ago, he warned against this type of mindset. Jesus himself put an end to food and drink restrictions in the name of religion. He said when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within 
and defile the man. So the five pillars of Islam are simply a legalization and codification of various facets of normal Christian living. For example, let me show you. Number one, confessing. You know, here's the five pillars. Confessing. Christians you know, confess their faith only one time at their conversion. Anyone here who has been baptized into Christ, what was the thing you said before you went into the water? Uh, in some way or another you said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, or I believe Jesus is the Savior. You confess one time for all time. What about prayer? You know, five times a day prayer? Christians are told to rejoice always, pray always, give thanks in every circumstance, 1 Thessalonians 5. I don't need a schedule or a mat or a compass to pray. I continually offer my prayers to the living God through the power of the Spirit within me, according to the authority and the instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 8. 15 and 16, John 14, 13. It's not an obligation for me to pray, it's a joy for me to pray. Big difference there. What about the zakat, the 2.5% tax? As a Christian, giving is not an obligation, it's an opportunity. God has allowed me to give him something. That's a favor to me, not to him. The only guidelines, as, uh, as Duane mentioned this morning, the only guidelines, we give based on what we have and we give with a cheerful heart. Imagine. How can you make a law out of that? What about the fasting part, the obligatory fasting? Fasting as a voluntary spiritual exercise when combined with prayer, it's profitable for maturing the individual or seeking God's will, or developing better control over self, good. Enforced fasting, as Paul says, does not serve a spiritual purpose, Colossians 2.23. Paul says, no advantage to the lust of the flesh. Fasting doesn't make you a better person. What about the pilgrimage to Mecca? The time when a place or a building here on earth has any significant religious purpose is past. I mean, they can drop a nuclear bomb on Israel and wipe out every religious shrine, every church building and just reduce it to rubble. And it wouldn't make an iota of difference to the Christian faith. Our faith is not based on buildings. Our faith is not based on shrines. It's not based on holy places. It's not based on relics. I saw a picture of thousands of, uh, actually we're all women, thousands of Muslim women who were, who were there uh, uh, you know, fighting with each other to get close to the holy place where a hair of the beard of Muhammad happened to be placed in a holy place. Can you imagine? Again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of those people's sincerity. I'm just saying, what kind of religion does that to people? Other than a religion that seeks to control. When I was released from the legalism of Catholicism, I want to tell you something. Nobody will ever get me back into the prison of legalism, nobody. And no one should ever get you back into the prison of legalism. Christ died to free us, not for this nonsense. The structure containing God's spirit is the physical body of the Christian. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Our lives as Christians here on earth is a pilgrimage, not to reach some earthly destination, but to reach our heavenly home with God. We're on a daily pilgrimage. The Christian religion and life is the substance and reality that is only suggested and poorly sketched out in the legalism of Islam. 
To be sure, in Christianity there are instructions about lifestyle and worship, but these are few and all encompassing. There's only one rule for lifestyle and that is to love one another. In Matthew 7 verse 12, what does Jesus say? In everything therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And in Romans chapter 13, Paul says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Not just a particular written law, has fulfilled the principle of law, any law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not coven. And if there are any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. We don't need religious police to, 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 to guide us in this commandment. The Christian religion and life is completely fulfilled in following Jesus Christ. No need for special clothing, no need for special haircuts, no need for lifestyle police, no need for food restrictions. As Christians we do as Paul says in Colossians 1, he says, above all clothe yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. We also have rituals that are commanded as part of our faith experience, but these are not done as ways to earn favor or righteousness before God, but rather they're done to memorialize what God has done for us. Baptism, which is immersion in water, that's a ceremony. Baptism of one who repents of sin and confesses Christ, why does he do that? to memorialize that moment in time when that person is set free from the guilt and condemnation of sin and born again as a Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to begin his pilgrimage to heaven. And communion, the Lord's Supper, a weekly ritual of bread and fruit of the vine where Christians everywhere gather to remember, to memorialize the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ the one who makes Christian freedom and life and hope possible. Every Sunday, I come here to celebrate my freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from the law, freedom from the fear of death, freedom from condemnation, freedom from any man-made religion, freedom, freedom, freedom. These two simple rituals begin and continue the Christian's witness of faith throughout his life. The rest of the New Testament deals mainly with how to live a life of holiness and love in a world where disbelief and false religion is the norm. Muslim extremists hate this aspect of our faith the most because our quiet assurance and holy life have the power to dissuade others from falling victim to their enslaving religion. This is why they go to great lengths to limit their people's exposure to the West as much as possible. They claim that they don't want good Muslims being corrupted by Hollywood, but I suspect that the real reason is that they don't want them to breathe the liberating air of Christianity. And so Christianity is the only religion of freedom because it offers the freedom to believe or not to believe and the freedom to live as a person chooses. Imagine. And then one more. Christianity's freedom enables its followers to be equal partners in this life as well as the life to come. Islam perverts the idea of male spiritual leadership originally taught by Paul in the New Testament. What does he teach in Ephesians? Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the, uh, of the body. 
But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Islam perverts this. The concept here is that the husband is responsible for the spiritual leadership of his wife and his family. In this inspired model, the wife willingly offers her submission because of her faith in Christ, not because she's afraid of her husband. In this model, the husband is ready to give up his life in support and protection of his wife in the same way that Christ gave up his life to create the church. In Christianity, both partners willingly give up something precious. The woman lays down her autonomy and the man lays down his life, sometimes in a single act of bravery, but most times he spends his time and strength and energy and heart in protecting and supporting and nourishing and leading his wife and family in their Christian pilgrimage that is life here in this dark and difficult world. Islam, for the most part, has perverted this idea of male spiritual leadership and transformed it into an excuse for suffocating male domination over women. The Muslim religion codifies female enslavement by relegating women to an inferior class of human beings. I quote their own scripture, Surah 4 verse 34, men are managers of the affairs of women because Allah has made the one superior to the other. That's not me, that's them. In the Muslim world, men dominate, they rule, they have most of the privileges because God has created them as superior beings. Well, that's what they teach. This false notion has led to the most vile of practices and aggression against women. For example, the denial of education in many Muslim countries of women, enforced dress codes, physical mutilation, and that's the PG version, you know what I'm talking about, but we're here with children. Uh, forced marriages and forced marriages of minor aged girls. Restriction of movement. It's, women are forbidden to drive cars. They're not permitted to leave the house without a male escort if they're single. Lack of protection under the law. Do you realize that under Sharia law, a man is entitled to have four wives? A husband in divorcing one of his wives need only to make a declaration in front of an Islamic judge without the woman's consent or even the requirement of her presence. However, if a woman wishes to divorce her husband, she must first get his consent. That's how it works. These young American women who convert to Islam to please their Muslim boyfriends, hopefully their husbands one day, they do so because they don't really know what they're in for should they ever marry, have children, or heaven forbid, travel to live in a Muslim country. Jesus Christ has done more to raise up the condition, the human value and potential of human beings than any other religious or political leader in history. He came at a time when many of the Muslim ideas and treatment of women were prevalent in the corrupted Jewish society that he lived in. His teachings and those of his apostles established the equal value and dignity of all women as created by God. In Galatians 3.26, Paul sounds the death knell for all philosophies and religions that sought to create a class system that advantaged one group over another based on culture, social position, or gender before God. And I read briefly, that's their scripture. This is our scripture. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's culture, there is neither slave nor free, social position, there is neither male nor female, gender, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs, according to the promise. So Christianity not only frees, it also adds those who are free to a fraternity of people whose intrinsic value is determined by what they believe and not who and what they are as human beings. Jews, Greeks, rich, poor, women, whatever. 
Christians are given a new spiritual identity and status and function by God, which describes their eternal function in heaven, which in time will completely replace what they are known as here on earth. One other scripture, 1 Peter 2, verses nine and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is our scripture. This is how our God describes us. Islam is a belief system made by man designed for a religious type of life here in this world. Christianity frees the believer to transcend this world so that the practice of his faith here actually gives him a glimpse and an experience of the world to come. Something that Islam cannot and will never be able to do. So I've shared a lot of ideas about Christianity and Islam. But here's the point I want you to hold on to when you leave today and when you wake up tomorrow and in the months and in the years to come as you read the paper and as you see the media and so on and so forth. Here's what I want you to remember. Islam will never win. Never. They will never win because they've got the wrong prophet. The Bible says God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions in many ways in these last days, these are the last days, has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. One more here. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the last and only divine messenger sent by God. He is superior to all others because of his resurrection. Last I heard, Muhammad was still in the ground. Why would God replace the messenger risen from the dead through which the world was created for this guy? who lived and died and is in the ground. Why would he replace the Lord Jesus with that guy? They will never win because they have the wrong book. Paul writes in that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which were able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching or reproof for correction for training in Righteousness, the Bible leads to salvation, righteous living and eternal life. What can another book add to that? Why would God send more information? Don't you have everything you need right here? They will never win because they've got the wrong mission. Jesus came up and spoke to them, the apostles saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, till the end of the age. Till the end of the age. Did he say, till another prophet comes along? Till you get more information? No, he said, I'll be with you till the end of the age. God has not sent us to infiltrate and conquer militarily or politically. God has not sent us to terrorize and murder. Look at the condition of the countries where Islam is the major religion. They're either at war with themselves or their neighbors or they're oppressed by their own religious and political leaders. Uh, anybody here apply for a visa to go live in uh, Iran lately? Or Iraq? Are the embassies in Washington for these Muslim countries, are there lines around the block so that people can just abandon America and go live in Somalia? Yeah, no. Look at the condition of other nations that have to deal with Muslims within their borders. 
terrorist attacks, a flood of refugees, the attempt by Muslim immigrants to establish Sharia laws and courts in defiance of these countries' laws and culture. Christianity, on the other hand, can function and flourish in any country or culture because its leader and body is not of this world, but of the next. History and experience has shown that when a country is based on and maintains biblical principles, that nation flourishes. The United States is the best example of that. A quick comparison of the US and any Muslim country will bear this out. And here's a personal opinion. I believe that the decline of Europe and its infestation with Islam is God's punishment on them for having abandoned Christianity. They thought they could just abandon Christianity and get rid of it and replace it with philosophy and look what's happened to them. Islam is having its moment, yes, but it can't win. Many others before them had the same hope of world domination and even succeeded for a time. The Babylonians and the Medes and the Greeks and the Roman Empire and the Nazis and the communists all had this idea. But Daniel the prophet correctly stated in his vision that during the world domination of the Roman Empire, another eternal kingdom would be established. And Daniel wrote, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That's us, folks and that kingdom will not be left for another people. That's us, folks. It will crush and put to an end all of these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. That's us, folks. That kingdom that David, uh, Daniel spoke of was established during the Roman domination of the world by Jesus Christ. One more. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barhona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. That's us, folks. If the gates of hell powered by Satan, cannot overcome it, then neither can a man-made religion. That eternal kingdom spoken by Daniel and proclaimed by Jesus never to be overtaken or destroyed by any power on earth, that includes Islam, or power in hell, that's the devil and his followers, that kingdom is the church that belongs to Christ. Let me say it one more time. Islam will never win. However, however, you can. You can and you will win if you are among those who have been freed from sin, freed from the ignorance of false religion, and added to those who are now one in Christ Jesus. I encourage the church not to be afraid of wars and rumors of wars. Not to be afraid of movements and ideologies that come and go. Just remember that in Christ, your victory is guaranteed. And so I encourage those who have not yet repented and been baptized to come and seize your victory at this moment. And I encourage the rest of the church to remember they will never win, ever. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, then we encourage you to come forward now as Bobby leads us in a song of encouragement.